you Jump, 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 jump What we done started Look at what we done started This the people party This is what we done started Party people in the place to be now rocking with the best. It's the world's best podcast, The People's Party. I am the BKMC, the MCEO, Talib Kweli, in the place to be, as always. And as usual, I got my lovely and talented and beautiful co-host Jasmine Lee. What's up, Jasmine? How you feeling? What up, what up? What's going on? I'm feeling fresh like those brand new laced up Tims you got you like, on. You like Looking those, right? Shout out to Tripoli. She laced my Tims properly. Like your top, too. What is Thank that? You. Velvet? It's velvet. It's velvet. Velvet. <laughs> We're going to have a lot of fun with today's mm -hmm. guest. She is an actress or an actor. We're going to be, you know, politically correct. Um, a comedian. She's been making a big impression since she appeared on America's Got Talent way back in the day. She was on That's So Raven way back in the day. She stands as the youngest comedian to perform at the Hollywood Improv in the stage when she was just six years old. Wow. She has performed... And Entourage, the Sarah, Sarah Silverman program, Hannah Montana, Spork, CSI, New York. You know her as Instant Moms, Gabby Phillips, as the voice of Pro Granger on Spirit Riding Free. She has appeared in Lifeline, Wish Upon, Santa Clarita Diet, Pretty Little Liars, The Perfectionist, Moxie, a hell of a film, and There's Someone Inside Your House, which is on Netflix right now. One of my favorite TV shows of all time is The Walking Dead. She is on The Walking Dead. It is a historic show and to think this young lady is only 24 years I know, old crazy. her credits are so extensive she's so absolutely skilled at her craft a mega talent a true joy to watch on the screen ladies and gentlemen boys and girls children of all ages put your hands together and make some noise for the amazing sydney park in the place people's party for the children how are you good to see you thank you for this thank you for coming out hello, hello. Oh, you smell lovely oh thank you so much yeah. What is that, impulse? <laughs> that Lalabo up in here, that Lalabo. How are you feeling? I'm feeling great. So happy to be here. How We're are happy you? to have you. Man, I, the energy is real. This Good. is like, oh, I feel like I can breathe. It's like a blanket. Good. Yes. You know? I'm glad you feel that way. That's the energy we try to convey here. Yes. So we're going to start off by talking about, okay, so six years old at the Hollywood Improv, when you first walked in the building, that's the first thing I asked you. Because yes. this this is amazing to me. Thank you. So tell me about what made you decide to do that and that whole experience. I was always a really hyper kid. Uh -huh. And that never really went away. Like, I <laughs> okay. still pride myself on being a big goofball. And mm -hmm. I've managed it, you know. Mm -hmm. But I, th I think I had a lot of anxiety as a kid as well. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't know really where to put the energy because I excelled in school, but I was disruptive. You know, I, mm -hmm. I was really a good student and made a lot of friends, but I was loud and class clown and all those things. And Those are good signs. <laughs> Thank you so those much. Those are signs of good parenting. <laughs> Just yeah. a, little, a little touched, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Um, yes, I, my parents really did support me um, and continue to, but I was at the Hollywood Improv and my mom would be getting ready for her shift. She worked there as a server. Oh, okay. And it's so crazy because my parents like quit their corporate jobs um, in the Bay Area where we came from. Mm -hmm. And they were just like, well, let's just move to LA and see what this whole like artist scene is about. And I'm gonna quit my like startup, you know, dot com job and and see what's up at the Hollywood Improv. Wow. Yeah. That's really crazy. Crazy. That's crazy, crazy that your parents were having like startup <laughs> dot com jobs. Yes. And I was like a yeah. fully grown man when this started. <laughs> <laughs> and they just up and, and moved to LA. Yeah, we up and moved to LA. My mom found a spot out here. Um and then my dad and I we we drove and we met her and um we were just like, well why don't we just see? And I was doing these little pre shows in mm -hmm. the dining room and I had a little pixie cut. Looked like a little Filipino mm. boy. It was so, it was a, little, <laughs> a little tomboy up in there with my hoop earrings, but a little pixie cut. And like right. my, I would wear my dad's Kangol hats. Okay. And I was just busting on people, just okay. joking. I remember the, the um, one of I mean, Spike is still there. I don't know if you guys know Spike. Spike. You know Shout Spike. Out to Spike. I, I Shout out to Spike. I haven't seen him since Shout before COVID. I don't know Spike, but Spike's we getting a lot of love. Spike, you got it. Spike is. Uh, <laughs> so is he doing Mondays at the oh, Improv? He then? still is. Yep. And D Ray. Well, he, D Ray, Ray shout out D Ray, Ray Davis. Shout D Ray, out to D. you're overdue on this show, brother. We're, D Ray, you're overdue. <laughs> yes, he is. You are overdue. But we, uh, he was like, Kelly, my mom's name is mm -hmm. Kelly. He was like, Kelly, Sid should go up. I'll put her up on Boba on Mondays. And my what? mom was like, She's six years old, dude. Like, what are you talking about? He's like, I see her. She's 
literally doing material in the dining room, busting on all my friends. This is how long she needs better to go. Monday I was just going, about to right? say that. How? Yes. Because six minus twenty four. Yeah, it's is been what? eighteen years. It's been like okay. twenty twenty plus. Has it years. always been D Ray? No, okay. not always. It was Spike's show at first, and now okay. it's Monday Rays for just, it's D Ray's show. But it was yes. Spike's for a, a long, okay. long, <laughs> long, okay. long, long time. I'm yes. glad y'all giving me these comedy bars. <laughs> wow, <laughs> that that is that crazy? that's freaking awesome. Number one, that they even allowed you to come to work while your mom was working. Listen, I I remember going back there a couple years ago, and I was 18. I'm 24 now, so mm. I was 18, and you know don't have a fake idea or anything mm-hmm. like that. And they were like, you know, there had been some turnover with the bouncers mm-hmm. and they were like, oh, we can't let you right. in here. And then one of the homies came out and was like, she was up in here at six years old. <laughs> let her in. Right. We gonna let her in. Right. So I did stand up for like six years and was going to school and would do some shows here and there on the weekend. And that's quite get a my skill. Homework done. It was that hard. Is I, actually, I actually did stand up again for the first time in like 10 years Two years ago, two years ago, right before the pandemic. And you didn't get the bug um, to come back? I definitely want to. And I was, I remember like waiting to feel when I was going to be nervous mm-hmm. on the day, on the day that I was doing stand up again. And I never, I never felt it, which was like, oh, I'm home. Like this feels good. I've been meaning to do it for a while mm-hmm. and I definitely go back for sure. Well, I definitely want to commend you. Number one, I keep saying I'm going to have my daughter start doing stand up at two as soon as she can. <laughs> can talk. But number two, because Aww. I've always known what I wanted to do since I can remember memories, but I never actively did it. And I was in New York where you, I could have actively did it. So for you to know that you wanted to be entertaining and then actually get on stage and do it at such a young age, like that's amazing. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. Now correct me if I'm wrong, but you were born to a Korean father and a black mother. Yep. That is right. How did that affect your upbringing? Affect it in in what in what aspect? In terms of your awareness of the race issue that permeates America and having to exist in many different spaces and in your own space all at once. I think I just saw a lot of like unconditional love, mm-hmm. and my parents were really active in telling me who I was and the mm-hmm. culture I came from, but then also allowing me to be my own breed of a person, like mm-hmm. my own specific thing, whatever that is, where mm-hmm. if more days I identify with my Asian culture or more days I identify with my black culture, like whatever that means for me, going where I feel good, going mm-hmm. where I feel accepted, loved, and well-received, because like that's what I saw my parents doing. You know, They had mm-hmm. a really broad spectrum of friends, and of course we have a mixed family, and mm-hmm. um, they love each other so deeply, and so I, I really grew up with an open mind. It opened up my heart so much, opened up my mind so much. And um, it really was a truly beautiful experience. Mm-hmm. They made me feel like uh, I just could take this world by storm and do mm-hmm. my own thing, you know, dance mm-hmm. to the beat of my own drum, not be tied to any standards, not be tied to what I look like. I was always taught to have a good work ethic. They mm-hmm. emphasized education and social life, friendships, and I just felt very well-rounded. I felt like I got a lot of culture just by being in the house, you know? That's beautiful. They did a good job. Right. And then being in LA, which is such a strong, prominent Korean presence too, that had to help out as well. It was interesting, you know, and and it's so funny you say that, Jasmine, because I didn't realize how prominent, you know, of a Korean culture we have here until really maybe a couple years ago. Oh. And looking back on my childhood, I was like, oh, wait, yeah, I did mm-hmm. go to school with a lot of like Korean friends and a lot of black kids and Jewish kids and Mexican kids. Like we get a good, strong group here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, representation is very important. Yes. For children. Yes. Um, and for adults, but really for children as you're soaking in all that knowledge like a sponge. Absolutely. Um, I want to give a shout out to your grandmother, Marlene Cole. Oh, OG Marlene. member of the Black Panthers, Marlene. right? Marlene, Marlene, <laughs> Marlene Cole. That's so funny you said that specifically uh-huh. because I know her as Crone. Now. Okay. But Cole is my middle name. So her father's oh. name is John Cole. Mm. Thank you for shouting her out. We love you, Grandma. Yes. Oh my God. <laughs> we love I you, love Grandma. So much. You don't we make do. me cry. You we shout do. out my grandma? Yeah. That's wow. Bay Area original <laughs> OG. Yeah. Black Panther Party. Yeah. Yes, Marlene. That's yeah. my that's my grandmama. Yes, indeed. That's one of the uh, benefits of coming up in the Bay Area is you have connections and being a person of color, you have connections yeah. to the Panthers. Yes. Um, you shared on your Instagram during the protest last year for George Floyd and Breonna Taylor 
um, something that I felt. You wrote, I'm done trying to make the oppressed feel at ease, uh, the oppressor feel at ease by remaining quiet. Um, That's very powerful. Um, Is that sort of the influence of your grandmother? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, Absolutely. You know, and the beautiful part about my grandma is that she grew up militant, but but then also so open. You know, her husband now of over 25 years is like 20 years younger than her and a white guy adopted from a small town in Texas. And he loves her and they, you know, have this really unconventional, like awesome life together. Mm -hmm. And she's very open. And I think what's great is I was taught to not be quiet. Mm -hmm. When you see something, say something. Mm -hmm. Stand up for it, no matter how small it is or big it is or what you think Mm -hmm. is small or big. Like, it all matters, you know? It really does. And I think that was my biggest concern with the issues leading up to George Floyd and, and on social media and people kind of like almost, how can I say this? They were overcompensating mm-hmm. with their with their support mm-hmm. or belief where I'm like, it's okay, right. but we just trying to say like we're humans, just want to be treated like a human, not mm-hmm. like a person in a zoo who's different, just like a human. Because right. we are. So either you're going to not be quiet about it and say something about it, or you are just as bad as everybody else who's like actively making a choice to be a racist. You know what I mean? Well, I'm like, true. it's not, it doesn't have to be it's that deep. You are making it deep because it's yeah. not our issue. Yeah, we had uh, Dr. <laughs> uh, Kendi you know? on the show and he was talking about, you know, being an anti racist and how that's different from just saying, I'm not racist. And it's just, right. it's, it's an action. It's something yeah. that you have to wake up in the morning and make up your mind to do. Right. Or um, if your friend says a backhanded comment, are you going to be like, hey, man, I wasn't, why are you saying that? What's wrong with you? Yeah, I feel you. Um, you know? I've gotten into a lot of, I actually got threatened to be slapped in the face when they get to LA because I said it was this Asian girl and she was, she, it was Black History Month and mm-hmm. she was, she she had posted some fried chicken, some other, some, some real racist shit. And it was this uh, black comedian that was like, reposted it and laughing about it. I'm like, how are you allowing her to 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 spread these this this crap mm-hmm. during Black History Month? And I felt like I is she to, is she a comedian? Was she trying to be funny? Was that what it was? The 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 girl was trying to be funny, but right. it did not come off as funny at all. Yeah. And if you're gonna be a, do a racist joke, it needs to be funny. Yeah. It wasn't funny. Period. And so I was <laughs> calling out the make other. Make sure person. your racist Just, jokes are funny. Everybody. Make sure your racist that jokes are funny. That is the message funny. of this show. Or don't be, be racist. <laughs> but <laughs> if they, if you are going to do it <laughs> for and, real, and and it's, it's just because. I had to speak up because it's like, mm-hmm. how are you allowing? This is your friend, yeah. and you're allowing her to talk like this. Now th- that's a reflection mm-hmm. on you. And you know, she threatened to slap me instead of wow. listening. But you know, whatever. Yeah, I get threatened to be assaulted every day on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, another show, I talk too much, and people be like, "We're gonna come and shut you up." Um, Dang. But what? Just to speak to <laughs> add on to what you're saying, what I get a lot of is for someone to always say something every time they see something. Not everybody can do that. Some people are right. they they have anxiety, they have stress, okay, they have yes. they have they have a, a, jo- a job where they can't be going off on the internet because it's going to reflect on their job. Of course, and so it becomes a situation where not everyone can do that. And for some people, it's triggering. It of brings course. up traumatic situations. But what I don't like is people who go out of their way to tell the people who are deciding to do that to stop. Yes, like you had the time to make a comment here. But instead of telling the person, the racist that I'm calling out, hey, stop being racist, you tell me, you tell me hey, ignore that racism because yeah, you stop can't reacting, solve it. Because you're not emotional. Like, right. stop, yeah, you that's... know, like you're too emotional, you're too sensitive. And it's like, you know, for the, like you said, the people who are triggered, the people who mm-hmm. maybe don't have the voice, mm-hmm. it's strength in numbers. So when you have other it's people, strength in numbers. Strength in numbers. You have people exactly that are like, right. okay, I'm going to stand up. Yeah. I'm going to take that leap of faith and take the risk mm-hmm. because, you know, back in the day it was life or death. Mm-hmm. More so like, oh, I'll just make an Instagram comment and maybe my coworkers will see it. It's, mm-hmm. oh, I'm actually going to get beat up and beat to death in the street right. or hung or my house is going to get set on fire. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like mm-hmm. you can say something without it being so out, you know, a, a, offensive or like, aggressive in that way like it doesn't have to come from a place of anger it can come from a place of love more mm-hmm. so like hey I just yes yes indeed you know yes, yes, but it is an interesting discussion I got rid of my Instagram I'm happy did you I sure did 
I've I've taken breaks, but I'm not ready to get rid of it. But I have had to take breaks. I deactivated it, got rid of my, you know, app, and I had never done that. And I've had a healthy relationship with Instagram for the most part Mm -hmm. of just posting when I wanted to and genuinely having fun with it, genuinely having fun seeing friends on there, Mm -hmm. like just girly things, you know? I'm like, ooh, I get to like see all these different pages and feeds and kind of filtering out how I want the energy exchange to go. Mm -hmm. But then after a certain point, I was just like, this is my life and I just need the privacy. Mm-hmm. It's crazy you, you said know? that because that was, and I haven't said this publicly, but this is something I've been thinking about. I've sort of been alluding to it over the last few few interviews. That was going to be my New Year's resolution. To get off of social for, media? No, just to, to delete the Instagram app for a month. For a little bit, yeah. Just for a month to see what, what that does for me because there's so many things. I can't not be on it. I have, shout out to Donna, I have people who help me, I have people who can post for me and do things for me. Yeah. I can still keep my Instagram going without it being on my phone. Let me tell so you that's this. what I think I don't even remember when I deleted it. It mm-hmm. could be three weeks ago. It could be a month ago. I don't really remember because after a certain point, it was like the instinct of checking it went away. Yeah. Mm. And the instinct of checking in with my life and my surroundings and like doing more just with my time mm-hmm. um, became more important. So that's right. highly recommend. It's really cool. That's and right. I didn't realize how much... Anxiety, it really does oh, put for sure. on you. Every time like, I post, I get anxious. I didn't realize. And not even, it doesn't even have to be crazy or like I'm comparing all the time or checking on likes. Mm-hmm. It's just like a, it's a thing of like checking a notification mm-hmm. or seeing if somebody saw what you, it's just, it's a, it can be a lot on the mental. So you make yeah. room for other things. Yes. Ooh, it is definitely a lot. And I, I, I have taken a break, like I said, but for me, I'm still very early in my career. So I feel like I'm not, I don't have the, I'm, I'm not in the same boat where I could just be like, okay, let me not be on social media. Cause it's kind of like, if I get off of social media, I feel like, oh, well, people will just forget about me and then I'll miss out on the opportunity. So I'm definitely working on that. So in 2006, you did America's Got Talent, the first season when people didn't even really know what it was going to be. And you did stand up, and you were first of all, <laughs> your stage presence at eight years old. People just don't. It's, it's like you're born with it, or you're not. So the, how you just burst it out. You honestly didn't have to say anything funny, and I already was in love with you because it was just like this girl is meant to be here. But how was that process for you? Were there any things that you really loved, or things that you know you would do differently, or how how, how was it? Man. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for saying that. I feel like, yeah, this is just so, I'm so flattered. It's so sweet. Um, I, I think I just felt in my element, mm-hmm. you know, I felt nervous, but then comfortable because I just always loved to perform and mm-hmm. entertain. And I like came out singing. My dad would just literally set up the camera and I would just make my uh, make up my own songs, singing for hours, doing sketch comedy and all, all of the in-betweens. Um, so I just felt very like supported, but I also never read into it as a child because mm-hmm. I genuinely just loved to do it so much. So I didn't really register like, oh, this is like, me going on national TV and being up on stage. It was more so like, yeah, it's pretty fun. I get to do this. And then backstage, I'm like, oh, my Game Boy. You know, like right. I'm just chilling. I was just right. a kid who really um, knew how to work a room. Yes. Like naturally. Yes, you always, did. I was always like that. And I could always hang around like my parents and the family and like their family friends and everybody's always like, oh shoot, here comes Sydney. Like <laughs> she, <laughs> here she comes, she got her tutu on, here she comes. I like. was saying to you earlier <laughs> that it's, it reminds me of the the first scene of the movie Raw, Eddie Murphy Raw. You, met, you ever seen that first scene? That's what it sounds it. like you're describing. Wow. I, I, if I have not seen Raw, I think that I should probably not be a comedian. I agree. And he's also yeah, from Roosevelt, New it. York. Shout out, <laughs> Eddie. <laughs> You get a pass. You're a little younger. Thank well, you. I don't Thank think you. I saw it as an adult. <laughs> Probably she's an adult. <laughs> well, now I'm an adult. You are an adult. <laughs> hey, I'm an adult. I forgot. Yeah, I'm sorry. You're, you're an adult. I you're am. An adult. You're I an am. Adult. It's okay adult. though. You know, this is why. This is why I take the knowledge right and the, and the wisdom. And I'm right. like, okay, great. I can, I'm gonna go home and do my homework. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just. I'm just saying. I didn't. it doesn't. Uh, it's it. He would get canceled if it came out today. Wow. Yeah, w- As a matter of fact, if you watch it on Netflix or wherever it's <laughs> at, it's probably going to be a disclaimer. Perfect. Yeah. I can't wait. That's, that's the I best. Don't know if it was, it, 
I, I gotta watch because I watched it on YouTube. I haven't seen. There's it definitely on no Netflix. disclaimers on YouTube. No, there's not. There's <laughs> definitely not. And it's grainy, so I probably should watch it on Netflix. Raw. Um, so after the improv, after um, America's Got Talent, you then went to a performing arts high school. Um, so did you just know that you were going to be doing something artistic, and, and at what point did you feel like you could really make it in the world in the acting? So universe? my. My high school was more focused on like, they were more sports oriented. Mm. We had a theater program that I was a part of, dance program that I was a part of because I grew up, you know, dancing and obviously doing theater in middle school, elementary. Um, so I was amongst kids who were going to Yale, Harvard, you know, SUNY Purchase, like all of these different types of cool schools. And I was, I had this sort of idea in my head of, well, either way, I'm good. Like, I love being here. I love my friends, the little tribe I found. The academia was really rigorous and challenging, so I learned a lot. I learned a lot about myself. Um, and it was either I was going to go to college and do that full time, or I was going to continue acting and see where it you know, was going to take me. And then I booked Instant Mom. Mm -hmm. um, but at the time, I was like, I was just about to stop acting because oh, I wow. was so, I was in this little weird place because I was 13 and mm -hmm. mixed. And it's like, okay, well, what role could I really get? Wow. You know, it's interesting. It's like, oh, well, maybe I'll just stay here and go to school. Mm -hmm. And that's fine with me. I'm happy like this. And then I booked Instant Mom and I almost didn't take the job. And I remember Aaron Kaplan called my agents and offered me the part. He was like, well, there's nobody else. And Vicki Thomas, who's the casting director, vouched. She was like, Sydney is the girl. And I was like, oh, man, okay. Yeah. Got a bit of a pickle here. <laughs> and ended up being on, on that show, finished high school on that show, and some of the best times of my life. It was amazing. Now, you said that you were in this space where you're like, okay, I'm a mixed child, and not, are there any roles for me? You're 13, but by that time, you had already done That's a Raven, right? I had. I'd done some guest stars on some Disney shows, mm -hmm. That's All Raven, Hannah Montana, you know, little guest star roles here and there. But I think it was kind of just like I, I was feeling the pressure mm -hmm. and I was feeling the rejection and that can get hard to separate, you know, yourself from the vision of other people when it's like mm -hmm. really not you, but it is you because you are the product. Like it is you. And then also that whole notion of like, oh wait, I'm a product. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, that's no. Yeah. Okay. Wait, what? Like this is, it, it was just, it was a lot. It was kind of, it started to weigh on me more than it had ever before. Right. Um, and then I booked that part and that opened up my whole Talk world about mom. once again. Yeah. Um, what the first thing I noticed about instant mom was you got to work with Cheryl Lee Ralph. Oh my gosh. Love who's somebody Cheryl. from my childhood. Love Cheryl. What was it like working with her? Absolutely wonderful. I was just celebrating her son's 30th birthday with him a couple weeks ago. He's, they're amazing. Like I absolutely adore Cheryl Lee and she taught me so much about what it means to be a leading lady, mm -hmm. to how to carry yourself, work mm -hmm. ethic, her humor, her everything like she's just a queen in every sense of the word and i absolutely have the utmost respect for her no doubt oh my god because honestly i'm obsessed with sister sister <laughs> I, I i you couldn't tell me those are not my best friends growing up like i absolutely for real twitches love sister, them sister. twitches it's just <laughs> i don't know twitches what's twitches kind of came later halloween movie it's that a, came later. it's, not, it's a movie like that? about witches I, and they're twins she was fresh yeah like, I know it came later. I'm it came later. They, they're Twitches. magical, whatever. Twitches, but, <laughs> magical. Okay, um, iconic. It, I'm sorry, Talib. And why would you be watching Twitches? I mean, okay, I'm so sorry. I know it's just a sister. <laughs> that, and, and you don't ever do that to me. I heard when the I'm Doja here Cat song. So, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm. A, I love Tia. Uh, um, I, I did some background on. Um, Family reunion, so I got to see her. You close did. My mom yes. directed a couple episodes of that did show. She? she did. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, Instant Mom was a vehicle for Tia Mari Hardick, Hardrick, or as much The <laughs> child actors were absolutely amazing, and there were some adult themes, and it was on Nick at Night. But what do yeah, you? Yeah, y'all were saying Amaze Balls on that show. Yeah, I, I say that word too. Yeah, Amaze but see, balls. Amaze Balls now it doesn't mean yeah. what it used to mean back in the day. What did it mean back what in the day? It was like I don't know. I just I. I think of balls when I hear amazing. <laughs> I 
Uh, okay. I mean, me too, but I think that's the whole point. It's kind of crude, kind of funny. Yeah, but it was Nick and Nate. Maze balls. Who said Maze balls? One of the little boys? One of the little boys said Maze balls. I, I, I don't think of balls when I think <laughs> I of a Maze balls. They had those boys saying everything. All I was like, shit. wait a minute. Well, it is Nick adult. and Nate still, though, so it's 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 yeah. geared towards adults, kind of, like even though wine kids drinking watch it adults. Too. Yeah, and then we right, lived kids. on TV. Like, it was kind of like the George Lopez element, right? Where it's like, yeah. you know, Nick and Nate, but family show, but it was right. adult. And too. I don't know if George Lopez was fully for kids, and kids mostly watch Nick and Nate. Like, right. we still watched it. Yeah. But anyway, what do you think? And I said anyway that time, Talib. <laughs> what do you think made uh, Instant Mom so unique? I, I keep saying, any, I start, okay, I say anywho, and I, I've been saying it my whole life. And then Talib texted me randomly one morning. He was like, when did you start saying anywho? No, so, because listen, we have to, I have to go at the end when we finish. These episodes, we watched them over and over again. Yeah. And you didn't start saying that until like a year and a half in. Like, you started being like... <laughs> I got comfortable. You got comfortable. Started being, Anywho. <laughs> and you started saying like six times per episode. So I was cute. like, yo. But the I crazy thing is that the same day you text me, somebody had wrote in the comment section, smile, <laughs> anywho, like, what, what are you... <laughs> no, because it's what me. happens is you're, you're relating to the guest. Yeah. And you're bringing in elements of your personal life. And then you get distracted. <laughs> and then you go, anywho, and then you get back to the internet. <laughs> That's what happens. Anyhow. <laughs> Dang. On the, con- <laughs> on the contrary. My name Bennett. I ain't in it. <laughs> what do you think made Instant Mom so unique and great? Oh, I absolutely loved the camaraderie we all had between us. Offset, mm-hmm. off camera. We just really vibed as a family as a presence, like Mm -hmm. we just, we were a family Mm -hmm. and we performed every week. We did live audience performances at Paramount every week, every Thursday. We worked four days a week. Tia made sure that like people had a set schedule, but that she could go home to her son. Mm -hmm. So I would do school on Fridays at the lot and then have my three day weekend. And she was able to be with her family and then our Mm -hmm. crew would get paid well and be with their families. Like it was such a beautiful tight ship and Mm -hmm. we just really really had so much fun it was so much fun like the laughs are unmatched down to like our crew and having the audience there having the people there who supported us like it was just so special it was it super, like super a fun special show. It it like y'all were having so a great time and then y'all oh. were dancing so much we were yes. dancing so much and the laughs <laughs> dancing man, up a storm. the laughs like it, yeah. we would have run throughs you know and we would go through the scripts and stuff mm-hmm. and i remember there were a couple times where i would go to other shows and it just felt a bit more like uptight or mm-hmm. like people weren't laughing as much and mm-hmm. so i realized like dang we really are funny up in here like we're really mm-hmm. doing some comedy little sitcom gold in here like she had to know what she was doing time. by that time of course yeah, yeah she had and, to be like yeah. a consummate professional when it came to and how's oh, the yeah. food cuz on black shows the food is always just a little bit better it is different <laughs> it is different we had bomb ass food mm. i'm not going to lie it was great we were very blessed and on show day we would I remember, I mean, I don't even know the half because I didn't get to sit in the green room with like the producers and like the adults. So I know they had mm-hmm. all kinds of stuff, champagne and sushi and the whole thing. Like Tia made sure that we had a very healthy um, diet for like the week, you know, mm-hmm. so that the kids were eating healthy. She was eating healthy, working out a lot too. And it was just great to watch that example. Okay. Awesome. You know? Um, the Walking Dead is absolutely one of my favorite shows. Oh. I really enjoyed it. It's one of the best shows that have ever been made. I think so. I'm a fan of the Thank zombie you. genre. We have Amari Hardwick coming in later, and he has this new movie out, Army of the Dead, with Zack Snyder. And I'm like, I want to. I can't wait to ask him about zombie shit. Yeah, <laughs> that's so cool. Oh, we it's gonna be Walking cool. Dead. Oh, I love Walking Dead, Yay. and I I want to say that the season you were in may be the best season, or at least my favorite season. Seven. Yeah. Really? Why? Because it's Negan. I find that like seasons one through five were my favorite. That's so seasons season one and two, it's the dynamic between um you know B- B- Barenthal yes. and um and Rick right yes and it's like the zombies are still a danger like at first they don't know that everyone Have has it. it at first and so the zombies is a real problem in those first few seasons but what it starts to happen is the zombies become the scenery. They become the background because now everyone knows how to kill a zombie. Yeah. So it's like, that just becomes, the zombies seem to be a mild annoyance. Mm-hmm. The zombies are like COVID. Right. It's just something we got to deal with. But then, now we figured out how to deal with the zombies. Now let's get back into this human bullshit. Yeah. And now it's human beings. That are the scariest. That are the scariest. Yes. And that's what Negan represents to me is that, mm. you know, 
I agree. Yeah. I mean, Jeffrey Dean Morgan is He's amazing. brilliant. And I remember when I first got on the show and they had just filmed that uh, season seven premiere. And Ugh. we know that was one of the roughest probably in TV yeah. history. Yeah, that's one of the rough, roughest hours of television uh, yes. ever filmed. Ever filmed. And and the crew, you know. And on a, on AMC with commercials. Yes. With commercial breaks. Yes. Crazy. Yeah. So gory, so heart-wrenching, just like. Gut over brain. the top. Just, <laughs> oh, over the top. Yeah. It was crazy. And I remember they were, my crew, they were still like, in shambles. They were like, it's going to shock you. Like, it's really going to shock you. And I'm thinking like, okay, well, damn. Like, y'all work on the show and you're still, mm-hmm. like, you're, right. they watched it back as a crew after they filmed it and were like still crying and yelling at Negan. Yeah. And like, it's so deep because you make a family out there and we're in the woods filming in the middle of nowhere in Georgia. So it feels oh, like summer no. camp. And mm-hmm. we really, you got to take care of yourself out there. Like, we take care of each other. And, you know, you have somebody like Steve Young who's been there for eight years. I mean, his performance was Michael Cudlitz. I mean, it was just yeah. like wow, wow. Um, wow. Your character was like the moral compass of Oceanside. Yeah, How much did you enjoy Cindy. playing this character? Oh, I enjoyed. I enjoyed That's it. That's so where I first much. saw you at. Yeah, it's uh, it's such a special role to be in because um, I think Cindy is a combination of a few characters from the comics, mm-hmm. and it it's. It was cool coming. I actually booked Walking Dead right after I wrapped Instant Mom. So oh, I was wow. 18, graduated high school at 17. We wrapped around eight when I was 18, and, and it happened so fast. I was like, oh, shit, I got to audition for The Walking Dead. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's highly competitive, but I was in the room with a bunch of girls that I had never even auditioned with before. Like Sharon Bialy, our casting director, is very specific when it comes to The Walking Dead and casting. And I find she casts a lot of comedians. There are a lot of comedians on the show. Yeah. Um, and so it was interesting. And then like they, I did one audition, they called me and they were like, Hey, you're, you're coming in to next week to walk to Atlanta and you're going to go right into weapons training as soon as you land and da da da. And I was just like, what, like, what's happening? Um, but it's, it's so cool. And like having all of those feelings and like you said, being this almost moral compass and mm-hmm. bringing that element into the show, mm-hmm. um, has been so much fun. It's been wow. a joy. You get I to really do Comic Cons and stuff like that? Yeah, we did some. Um, I never got to go to the Comic Con. We were, I was supposed to be in uh, Germany for a Comic Con. Okay. Didn't get a chance to, but did some like different conventions around okay. the country, Walker Stalker and all those things. Okay. Met some really cool people. And it was an experience. It still is. Fun. We mm-hmm. still, yeah, yeah, you know, we'll see. Why do you think that zombie culture is so widespread? I think because... We are all afraid of the human mind, what we're capable mm. of, and and our technology and the contamination of the mind, the like overuse of power, the abuse of that. I think this. I think a zombie is more significant in a way of like, wow, this is where we could go. Mm. This is where he, the human species could go. Mm-hmm. It could. This could. This choice could be detrimental, and this is where we could be. Whether it's like you know, maybe over the top for some people or not. Like, look at what happened in the past couple of years with this pandemic, right? Right. And, all and of, the grocery stores, right. the tissue. All like, of this weird stuff and, like, the the lack of honesty and, you know, wondering where all of this is coming from. Like, I think a zombie just signifies all of those questions of, mm-hmm. whoa, did we do that? Yeah. And then in Walking Dead, oh, it's us. Yeah, <laughs> we are the Walking yeah, Dead. We are the Walking Dead. Yeah, yeah. Uh huh. Me and my son Justice, both Jasmine and I have new newish children. Oh. Um, and I'm me and my son Justice love. Did <laughs> <laughs> you say? Oh. As I'm still getting used to her. She's new, Congrats. but they're two weeks apart, which is crazy. Yeah. Wow! Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah, we planned that. Um, <laughs> so did we? <laughs> did we? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, it's funny. I remember. I remember. I, really? I remember. I remember. I we, I took oh, you out to dinner, right? <laughs> yes. And I was like, yeah, it was just she's pregnant, and Jasmine's was like, me too. And then wow. Tyler pushed my wine away from me because I had red wine, and he was like, I have a little bit of red wine. <laughs> um, me and my son love watching Spirit Riding Free. Oh, I love that show. You do. Yeah. yeah. Guys. Tell me about working on that. 
Oh my gosh, this is just like my heart is so warm right now. It's, it's so full. Like, oh, wow, good. I'm so happy to be here with you. Oh man, yes, yeah. we're starting our morning. Make it a off black great. man blush. Thank you. Mm. Oh my gosh, this is wonderful. Yeah. Um, working on Spirit Writing Free was an amazing experience. Mm. We we finished, I think, last year, mm. and uh, I worked on it for three years before it even came out. Mm -hmm. And Prue Granger is a black girl equestrian, and her dad knows everything about horses. And so mm -hmm. when I went into DreamWorks to audition, Ori, who wrote the project, mm -hmm. um, she was like, oh my gosh, this is our proof. But then I saw I saw the prototypes for the character mm -hmm. and she looked like me. Right. And I was just gushing. I was like, oh my gosh, this is so insane. And my girl, Amber Frank, who plays Lucky, she looks like Lucky. And then my girl, Bailey, who plays Abigail, looks like Abigail, but she just, they just have different hair colors. Like mm. It's so funny how our characters really matched up, but that's just the beauty of God and the universe and how yeah. things just all connect and it's all for a reason, you know? Yeah. Um, but it's been a joy because I really I really love that show specifically because it shows healthy relationships and real friendships. Mm -hmm. And you don't see a lot of female-oriented cartoons. Mm -hmm. I grew up right. with some like Dexter's Lab and mm -hmm. Spongebob, which I love. Mm -hmm. But Prue and Abigail and Lucky have adventures and they get into all of these like crazy situations, but they're girls. But it's not focused on the fact that they're girls. And then you show healthy parenting and like healthy father-daughter relationships mm -hmm. and it's just very special that way it's also very dramatic there's a lot of drama in that show there's always a, there's <laughs> always a problem a spirit. what are they doing to that damn horse <laughs> right it's deep you're deep. like what's it going deep. on it does it's like <gasps> yes the stakes are high the stakes are high the stakes are every high episode it's around. like yo yeah i love that you watch this with your baby i, I can't wait, wait to watch it with my baby one day yes. oh my gosh yes. so sweet yes, yes. Just so wait. sweet just wait wait uh, wait <laughs> I, and I'm coming, I waited a long time. I'm in my 30s, but still, wow. I could have waited till 40 too. Uh, <laughs> so I was obsessed with the original Pretty Little Liars. I've seen every episode, and it was wow. it was just a huge phenomenon. So how was it like for Pretty Little Liars, the perfectionist, which is you know already having those fans that are expecting to see what they want to see? How was that experience for you? Guys, I've been so blessed with working some working with some incredible human beings, mm -hmm. like truly humble, talented, smart humans, which I feel like mm -hmm. doesn't happen often. Right. Um, so it was an amazing experience. Like we filmed in Portland, Oregon. I absolutely adore that city. Great city. It's a great city. Yes, Marlene Voodoo's King, Donuts. Voodoo's Donuts, yeah. Blue Star, the food, the Thai food. I mean, just like yeah. the greenery. I love the small town oh, feel. Oh, the greenery, huh? It's mm. just beautiful. The greenery. <laughs> In Portland, I know all about that. <laughs> I think, right? Oh, I the know. greenery or the greenery? Oh, the grass, the green yeah, grass. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah we, grass we, we shout out. Um, yeah, man, it was it was really really special. But Janelle Parrish and Sasha Peters uh, Schaefer, like they were such wonderful ladies to lead us into that space because we, as newcomers into that world, felt mm -hmm. like we, there wasn't a lot of pressure. It just felt really fun, and we were like mm -hmm. welcomed and. It was a community, you know, right away too. And um, they were, yeah, Sasha and Janelli were just like great people to introduce us to that, you know? Yeah. It's fun. As I'm listening to you tell your story, that's exactly it. That seems to be the theme, these great people that you find yourself surrounded by. Yeah, like mentors and yeah. and aunts and uncles and chosen family and like people who just really who got my back and it's yeah. all love. Like that's very... Very special, I feel like. Yeah, definitely. One of my favorite performers of all time, um, I'm not exaggerating with this either, I really love to watch this lady work, is Amy Poehler. My, right. oh, we need you, Amy. I, yeah. I love you, Amy. Yeah. Like, go ahead and send her a little texty text <laughs> after this, because I've... Uh, I, me too, Talib. Tell me about your... I just, I mean, her. she's just fucking hilarious she to is. watch in every single thing. She's, yes. We need to send and her a baby love video. Mama Let's take a selfie video after this. I'm going to send Baby mama is the shit. Baby, baby mama's the mama shit. Did you just stick that gum favorite. underneath my table? I, mean, I wish no. this was on <laughs> I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? I don't know. No, yeah. she, she just She's so great salty. in that. Oh, yeah. She's great in that. And then what's mean the one? Mean Girls. What's the, yeah, Mean Girls. Uh, Parks and Recreation is, is vies for like my favorite show of all time, depending on my mood. You know, I've watched every episode about this. I've done interviews about it. Yeah. Um, I was excited to watch... Moxie, which you in it because of Amy Poehler. But I didn't realize how good it was going to be. And I didn't realize how much I was going to enjoy it. Thank you. Um, it attempts to be progressive. 
Um, it's high school characters. They complain about having to read books by old white guys. And I found that to be very interesting. A lot of pro-black themes, or excuse me, anti-racist themes and punk rock themes. It's like written by a badass punk rock person. It had to be, right? Well, Jennifer Mathieu originally wrote the novel Moxie. Okay. Um, and, you know, they adapted it into the screenplay, but Amy is... I mean, such a force, mm -hmm. and she's such a leader and, and has no, like, pretentious... She has a zero pretentious bone in her body. Like, mm -hmm. she's amazing. So and, and just as funny as you would think she would be. Mm -hmm. She's oh genuinely... Go I mean, when I tell you I was cracking up right. off set, I'd be like, Amy, wait, like, you're telling me this story right now? Like, this is hilarious. Yeah. I remember we first watched Moxie, and she invited us all to her house. Mm -hmm. And it was just such a... It really... Her, her space was such a happy home. It was so beautifully decorated. It was eclectic and mm -hmm. fun and tasteful and a magic world. It wow. was like this beautiful world. And I remember we're walking through her garden and you know she's like barefoot and just like super chill, like right. just mama bear. And I'm like, Amy, this is really stunning. Like this is beautiful. Like it's deeper than just the aesthetic. Like this is beautiful. This mm -hmm. is you. And she's just like, thank you. She's so sweet. And I remember right before the pandemic, we had, we had a girls' night mm -hmm. at one of um the cast homes in Toluca Lake, and we were like, let's do Taco Tuesday in the group chat. We all have a group chat. And she was like, I'll do Wednesday. And we're like, anything for you. Right. Oh, we'll make Wednesday. it work. Like Wednesday, we're going to make Taco Wednesday. Let's yeah. go. So Taco we're like, Wednesday. Amy ain't going to show up. She's so busy. Like, mm -hmm. Amy ain't going to show up. She showed up and had a whole loaf of banana bread wrapped in a cloth with like a little yarn. That she made? That she made. And <laughs> wow. I, I took it in the kitchen and I was sitting there and I was looking at it. She was like, and I, I looked at her. Just imagine Amy Poehler's face. Okay. Uh -huh. She's big like, ass I did that big ass with those big, beautiful <laughs> eyes. And she's like, you want butter on that? Open it up before we had our meal, and I was like, "Yes, I do." Yes, yeah, I she do. was amazing in um, what's that movie? <laughs> Blades of Glory. Yeah, yes, <laughs> Blades of Glory, Mean Girls. But she's everything. Um, I want to talk more about later on. Um, we're gonna talk more about there's someone inside your house, but I noticed that I feel like you pick projects that are progressive. Is that true? Yeah, okay. absolutely. I'm very specific. Like, of course, as an actress, you know, you're gonna have credits where you're like maybe not the proudest of that you're like oh mm -hmm. that was a paycheck or oh mm -hmm. that was a you know lateral move like not right. really a career thing it was just kind of a huh, let's see I'm, I'm, i want you to continue <laughs> your thought but we had so many actors and comedians come on the show and i'm glad you said that like you were maybe it's a lateral move because sometimes we ask these people about this they'd be like you know what you know what I had the best time on that set, and I'm going to tell you why that was the best experience I had. <laughs> mm -hmm. This terrible, shitty movie I did, yep. it was the best experience because I met this guy, <laughs> <Yep>. and then, <laughs> that's what they do. But yep. you were like, no, it's just, it was a check, a lot yeah. of move. <laughs> <laughs> it happens sometimes, yeah. it happens. And also, you don't, maybe you're not expect, you're expected to go one way, mm -hmm. and it goes the other way. But I do, I am very specific with um, the projects that I pick, and especially mm -hmm. now that I'm getting older, mm -hmm. and now that I'm... Reevaluating how I le want my life to go and the stories that I want to tell, mm -hmm. aside just from being in the industry, like the type of woman I'm becoming, mm -hmm. right. it's very important to me to pick projects that are meaningful to me and are thought provoking, make people think, make people feel good, make people feel seen. Mm -hmm. um, because that's what we're here to do. It's all yes. about connecting as humans, you know? Yes, I agree. It is very important. And, um, Moxie, for instance, it deals with rape culture, which needs to be talked about on the daily basis with your daughters and your sons, because I feel like men just do not understand rape culture. Like, they no, really don't true. understand when we're you programmed say no to, and you keep... We're programmed to feel like it's a reward to not understand it. You know, I had a, 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 a real debate. I'm not going to say the person or anything like that. But it was a it was a huge thing because, um, never mind, I'm not going to get into it. It's, it's a little fair. too much. That's fair. But that the is point fair, is, fair. men do not understand mm. what is considered a harassment, sexual harassment. Yeah. When, when someone says no and you keep trying yeah. to 
talk to me, oh, just the tip, or let me do this, right. or whatever. That's all a part of... That's all a part of, of, Well, of, in turn, it makes us as women not understand it. That so we too. don't know how to protect ourselves. That, and we make excuses. Well, it actually wasn't rape because he did this, or it wasn't because da 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 Like, no, you got to say what it is. I've been there. I've been in positions where I'm like, that was actually sexual assault. Right. And I might call it rape. Mm-hmm. I've been right? Like, because, yeah. but we're taught that it's yeah. like, well... The lines are blurred. It's like, yes, no, it's yes, kind of yes, not, yes. though. Mm-hmm. Yes. And it's so... And that's like, why, well, that's where the culture what? part comes from, right? Right. That's why right. I, exactly. And that's why, yeah. you know, it's so important to explore it in, in movies such as Moxie. Because even with... I've been in situations, well, not multiple, but I've been in a, a situation or two where I did have sex and didn't say no just because I didn't want to feel like, yeah. okay, I was sexually assaulted. Right. But I didn't want to do it. You know right. what I'm saying? You're just like kind of like... Yes. already there and it's like all right let me just whatever yeah. so how did you feel being a part of you know the conversation mm-hmm. on the day i remember that scene was really hard and amy again another reason why she is such an incredible human and i have so much respect and love for her mm-hmm. she we were here with a bunch of background you know we're like this our girl is coming in and she has this like monologue that's really hard to watch and mm-hmm. it's sad. And Amy made an announcement. She was like, hey, we have people here. We have people here that can help you if anybody feels triggered. If we need to stop, please raise your hand. Please let us know. There's some sensitive content here. If anybody feels like they need help, you can come to me. Mm-hmm. We have people here. Like she just made it a point to to show love. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it was uh it was really empowering and sad. Because I know these girls, you know, I, I we we've all heard these stories, mm-hmm. um, and the fact that so many times people look the other way, or it gets brushed underneath the rug, or you know, you look at somebody's redeeming qualities, and you're like, oh, he can't be a rapist, and if he is, well, but but it's like no, right. but but we need to win the big game. Yeah. yeah, and you're just like, wait, what? Like you're yeah. pro- you're protecting this person. Well, you never and done that to me. On top of that, and I love right. Marsha Gay Harden. Marsha Gay Harden is amazing. I thought she did an awesome job as the principal, and her work mm-hmm. is incredible just throughout her career mm-hmm. and as a person. Like she was so cool. I loved getting to know Marsha and that specific character where you're like, wow, you are just as bad as everybody else who's looking the other way. Yeah, and you're a woman doing that. Like you're just a a man without a dick. <laughs> What's happening? You're just a right. man without a dick. You're just a man without a dick, but even worse because <laughs> right. it's like you're like wh- what? You know? Right. So it was it was interesting. Yeah. It was interesting. Um, there is someone inside your house. Very fun movie. Thank Looked you. like it was fun to make. It was. Um it's it a was. novel from Stephanie Perkins. <laughs> yes. Uh the novel is a homage to Scream, and I know what you did last summer. Um, I love the fact that there's two black girls at the heart of the movie. That's my girl, too. I just saw her the other day. How you pronounce her name? Some Asia. Asia. Asia Cooper. spelled very interestingly. Black people. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I, don't know what I, said. She was, I was like, Asia? She was, I was like, like, Asia? I was like, bitch. Uh, uh, as J. Ha. Come on. Right? As J. Ha. As J. Ha. As J. Ha. It's not her, it's her parents. Why her mama do that? Yeah, oh, we love you, little she, mama. She was amazing in the movie. Um, <laughs> yes, you called was. it. A John Hughes horror film. How do you know about John Hughes movies? Oh, my gosh. Growing up What do you know about John <laughs> Hughes movies? Growing up with some really dope parents that introduced me to all that stuff. Mm-hmm. My parents introduced me to Gene Wilder and Richard mm-hmm. Pryor and John Hughes and Lauren Hill. Have you Hill, ever seen John, Richard everything. Pryor's interview in Utah with the Mormons? No. All right. It's not ready for primetime television. Yeah. So, That's the best. I will YouTube yeah, that go, shit. Yeah, go YouTube Richard Pryor interview with Mormons. Ooh, he's I'm talking, so curious. He's talking about Gene Wilder in this interview. Okay. Yeah. I know. Don't get mad cool. at me when you watch it. I'm not going to get mad. <laughs> like, it's really out there. I yeah. I mean, Richard Pryor But as Pryor someone who said Gene, Gene you know? Wilder, you're going to enjoy watching that. Okay. But I didn't mean to cut your wisdom. No, please. all good. I, yeah. I'm excited to watch it. Oh, yeah. I didn't um, know about that interview. You um, This is a horror movie. Right. Um, It's definitely... Scary. Definitely makes you jump. Um, you did Wish Upon before this. Right. And you did Walking Dead before that. What's your predilection? Is that the word? Is that a word? Predilection? Did I say that right? I don't know, but it sounds good. Predilection. Predilection. Don't ask Somebody me. Look I Somebody look everything. up the, the, the yeah. computer in their hand. Yeah. Predilection. <laughs> What's your predilection for horror films? <laughs> 
a hard project. Know, Salim. I think, well, my birthday is on Halloween, uh, actually yeah. on the 31st. Are you born on the 31st? I'm born on the 31st. So just like Farrell Munch. Halloween 1997. He's born on the 31st. Man. Yeah. yeah, I'm a Halloween baby. My mom likes to say it's the scariest day of her life. Oh. She keeps telling me that. Hilarious. Hilarious. Shout out to mama. But, um... I don't know, honestly. It's so funny. When I, growing up, I was always. Well, that's it. That's it right there. You answered the question. I guess so, right? <laughs> this is a, yeah. I guess that's kind of, it's a. It's, a, it's in your blood. Yeah. In a way. It's like a. I'm glad. I'm thing. not a fan of Halloween. I'm Why? a fan of horror movies. Yeah. I understand, I understand the amusement park quality of a good horror film. Like the, yes. the thrills and the chills. I love that. Okay. Um, I don't know. Maybe a superstition. I or maybe you. it's growing up in New York, and there was I'm triggered by the '80s when they was like putting razor blades in the kids' candies and shit say, like that. They, yeah. they that was always like a fair. I've never even heard of anybody I know actually having a razor blade in their candy. It was a thing when I was a kid. Yeah, Damn. it was still it was still a a, a rumor or like a scare when I was a kid too. But I yeah. like the fact that Farrow Munch is one of my favorite people and artists born on Halloween because now I can celebrate Farrow's birthday. So now I can celebrate yeah. your birthday. You know what I'm saying? That's like, nah, it's not Halloween. No, I this is you. Sydney's birthday. Oh, thank you. Yeah. You know, what I don't what I don't appreciate about Halloween these days is that I feel like uh it's too we get it, it it's become like this evil holiday. Mm-hmm. Um I don't like that. And it's in, in growing up, I was always afraid of like trick or treating. Like I would go trick or treating, but I wouldn't last. I was such a scaredy cat. I didn't start watching horror movies until like maybe 15, 16. Mm-hmm. And the times where I would take peeks at like The Exorcist that my parents were watching, you know, mm-hmm. I was just like, oh no, like crazy. Fun fact for you mm-hmm. Walking Dead came out on my birthday years really? ago. It premiered on what my Halloween? birthday. Oh, wow. And I remember my parents, we had the big wow. box like TV and there was no like DVR and they were and they were like, go out with your friends for Halloween. We're going to watch we're gonna this watch show. This. The Walking Dead. And I've celebrated my birthday twice out there with them. I've turned 19 out there and I wow. turned 20 out there. Awesome. That's dope. Yeah. Um, there's this movie, um, The Hunt. Did you see The Hunt? With who? Who's in that? I don't know. It's Hunt? a blonde girl on the cover. <sighs> No, I don't think but so. But it's a movie, film? it's like a revenge fantasy film. Okay. Where it's this game that these liberal elites are playing and they're like murdering deplorables mm. and like murdering right wingers. It was hard for me to watch because as someone who is more like a progressive or more like a liberal than I am a right winger, right. I'm like, we don't act like that. We, yeah. You know, and yeah. so Knives Out. There's this other movie, Knives Out. I love Knives Out. I love Knives Out. I love, I've seen that like three times. Me too. I watch it over and it's over so again. It's so good. It's so good. <laughs> it's so good. And Chris Evans is so good. He's brilliant. Tony but, Collette. Mm. Right. And they, but they deal with, you know, they have the character who's like a white supremacist, the, the son, right? And so there's elements of this in this movie. There's someone in your house. You you have essentially like, it's like a revenge fantasy against yeah. Chad's and Karen's. <laughs> you know what yes, saying? which I find very interesting. It's almost like a um, a release, sort of. But do you find was it ever a conflict in terms of? Well, I guess it wasn't because like the the I, so I'm trying to I'm trying to ask this question without giving away the plot of the movie right. for people who haven't seen it. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, but like, what's your take on the whole like in the Trump era? We start to see. Yeah. Violent yeah. revenge fantasy movies, like aimed at deplorable fucking people. What is fascinating to me is this, you know, cancel culture. Mm-hmm. I don't agree with it. I mm-hmm. think it's really harsh, and and it's not. Uh, we we're lacking humility. Mm-hmm. We're lacking humility for all beings, for the white yeah. supremacists, for the liberals, for everybody who's been taught wrong and taught one way. And you know, like we're lacking humility for us all, which I think, in turn, makes us more violent. Where mm-hmm. you do see maybe quote unquote the liberal person being more violent, and then yeah. you see the other person like being more violent with their words and their actions. Mm-hmm. It's just a, it just, it brews up everybody to just hate each other all over again. Yeah. Um, and I think that is something that we've seen in the past five years and something that I've fallen into as well of just mm-hmm. like hating a Trump supporter. And I'm mm-hmm. like, but what does that really mean? You know, mm-hmm. like, what does that really mean? Do I have to hate somebody because of their politics or even mm-hmm. their lack of understanding of politics or the world. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like they're not out here being a KKK member. That's a different story. Yeah, there's definitely but levels like, to it. 
There are levels to it, but and it's an interesting discussion. For and I, sure. I'm, I'm glad you used the word hate because, see, that's for me because I'm definitely someone who was, you know, like Eminem said when he did the BT Wars, one of the reasons I love Eminem as an artist is because he said, I'm drawing a line in the sand. And I don't remember the exact lyric. But he was like, listen, if you support this guy, you're not my fan. I'm drawing a line in the sand. And that type of bravery or that type of like using your platform to say what you want to say, I applaud that. But you're right in terms of the hate thing. Mm-hmm. Sometimes We're people- are dividing us more. Yeah. Hate, we, I, I try my best to eliminate any type of hate from my emotional state. It's, to mm-hmm. me, it's a weak emotion. Yes. It's a natural emotion. Yeah. We naturally feel hate, but that is your weakest moment. And that's mm-hmm. the moment when you're making the worst- possible decisions yes. when you're hating someone. Yes, agreed. Like we have to be better than the people who hurt us. Yeah, we yeah, have to be better than them. It's do. not not to, it's not the goal is not to be just like them, right? No. Yeah, yeah exactly. Mm. Or, I just went to Atlanta a couple of weeks ago to see your homies Chappelle and my homie uh, Jeff. But what I, I got him. from that whole trip is to lead with love. That. And I've been Always. that's been like mm. a major thing that I have to keep Reminding myself when someone pissed me off. It's a daily Wait, practice. so did you it go to? Did you see practice. the film? Yeah. No. Uh, okay. I saw a lot. He was of in the, the back fi- smoking weed, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I was oh, networking, Tyler. Okay. I was like the. That's whole, what. Yes, that's a networking. fancy word for smoking weed. That- <laughs> networking. Pot brings people together. Hey, <laughs> it's all good here. It's all right. <laughs> I saw. I saw. I, I'm not gonna. I saw a good amount of it. Okay. But I was. I was. I was. Come she on. was having fun. Chappelle. Um, time. He it has this networking. film that documents his summer during the pandemic. Mm. Um, and just he was throwing shows out in the cornfield in Ohio, and I was out there for a lot of the shows. But wow. he, because of this controversy with the closer, none of the studios have bought the film. So you mm-hmm. got to push it itself. So he's been showing it. He's like Kanye mm-hmm. West of comedy now. He's been showing it at stadiums. Across the country, Pat sold He's out stadiums. Just himself, and and, and, yeah. and and you're somewhere in Atlanta. It's a great film too. You're somewhere in Atlanta where people don't believe in 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 the whole COVID thing, and they're having to show either a vaccination or a negative COVID test. So these people are going out mm-hmm. and getting tested so that mm-hmm. they can come and see Dave Chappelle with no no other backing. And honestly, it was well worth it. And then the, sh- the show after the documentary, like he did stand up, he did the documentary, and then it was just like my concert. It was like my college life, wow, just on stage. And wow. I just was like, it was just such an amazing experience. Thank you so much, Jeff, for letting me be there. Wow. But um, it, I know it, it was awesome. That's so cool. So since we I were just Atlanta. talking about smoking, yeah. let's talk about Atlanta. the prevalent cannabis use. And there's someone inside your there's someone inside your house. Um, how in tune are you with how weed has been characterized across various cultures? Well, I'll say this. I think what's fascinating to me is that people don't take weed as being a drug. Mm-hmm. Oh, it yeah. is a drug. It's, it's like also, Adderall, right? It's like a... Pr- Shut up, Talib. <laughs> I don't... I don't uh, 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 uh. And I'm a I'm like a little Cali starter kid, like you know, it's kind of it's kind not of a drug to me. It's you know, like yeah, yeah. It's, it's part medicine. of my charm in a way. Yeah. Um, but you know, I also recognize it being a privilege. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, and I think especially <laughs> now, weed is so there's so many chemicals that can go into it, and yeah. it can be really engineered in a certain way, and it affects people in a different way. I know sometimes when I smoke, I'm like, oh, I'm too here, like I'm too mm. paranoid, I'm too in my head. I had to be careful because it's, I think, everything in, like, moderation and balance, you know? But um, specifically with there's someone inside your house, I think because we're just showing, like, teenagehood and what it means to experiment with sex and drugs mm-hmm. and all those things that help to kind of shape us, mm-hmm. yeah. you know? Um, it was just depicting something that's, like, true to life. Though I will tell you... I in my high school years, I never hot box with my friends. Me I never went to school high. Like I would experiment That's all with I did in high school. I didn't smoke. In I high didn't school. do that. Yeah. So I got to do it on the set, but it was still a little phony, like yeah. oregano. Movie, that movie gave you a headache. Like, that, yeah, yeah. Like, the the herbal thing. ones. But it's really yeah. funny. I'm like, huh? I never got to do this. You, you know what, Tyler? Not only did I not smoke in high school, I condemned smoking in high school. My ex boyfriend, the uh, uh, shout out Tim Jackson. I used to get Ooh. his. Ass for smoking, <laughs> and I remember he would pick me up high one time. And I was just like, uh, "We could get pulled over. We could go to jail. Like, uh, what are you doing?" And now, oh yeah, I had people <laughs> in my life who did that to me too. Are you looking at your daughter? No. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, who was he looking at over there? <laughs> I'm not looking oh at anybody. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> I'm um, coming 
back. Yes, I'm you got to come back. back. Hang out with us all yeah, day. That's what I'm going to be a part. I'm going to be out there with my headset and Please. filing papers. We can, we can do, I you can do a boom. We don't even do booms, but you can yeah. do it. I want, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> um, Yay. Yeah, like one of my favorite parts of that movie is <laughs> when you, y'all was like, people still smoke cigarettes? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, yo, this is, yo. Right. Sign of the times. <laughs> I'm like, yo, we're at a po- we're at a point when <gasps> cigarettes are not cool. I've, I've never lived right. this experience in my life. It's beautiful. Um, <laughs> uh, you're born on Halloween, as we just established. Um, so, as a Halloween girl, I want to talk to you about the term "final girl." Ooh, right. Men, mm-hmm. women, and chainsaws. Author Carol Glover came up with the term "final girl" to describe the horror movie trope of the last woman alive to confront the killer and survive. So. I want to talk about some of my favorite final girls like Sigourney Weaver oh, and yes. Neve Campbell yes. and uh, Jamie Lee Curtis. Jamie Lee Curtis in Halloween. Yep. You're like one of these final I, girls. Now. It's crazy. And I'm honored to even be in the category. And when right. I was doing press for the film, I had so many people that were like, so you are our final girl and da da da. And I was just like, of a, of a generation. Oh gosh. Yeah, I was like, what? Yeah. The, like only Korean and black final girl. <laughs> but I, you know, I'm like, what? Like this little girl who's mm-hmm. coming from Hawaii moves to Nebraska. Mm-hmm. I didn't even think of it in that way. And so it's really cool to be in that category of leading ladies um, and also making it till the end, confronting that, confronting it, all of yeah. it. Um, it's really, uh, it's really a trip, and and this whole experience too, working on there's someone inside your house was definitely epic. Probably one of the fa- my favorite projects I've ever worked on. Not just because I thought like the script was dope, and we were gonna make something really cool and original and fun, and if anything, just like thought provoking, but a solid like horror film. You know, yeah. right? I met some of like my best friends. Patrick Bryce, our director, was such a just a, a leader in so many ways and he really took care of us and we had so many great discussions and we just became like really close and it felt like it was beyond us you know doing something that Netflix is like putting up it was like oh we're all here mm. this is really a cool experience like we were really able to enjoy each other through that process and so the film is more dear to me because of the people rather than like the end result, which I'm so happy with, but it was, it's, I, my greatest memories are just the connection yeah. I've had with these awesome yeah. human beings. Slasher films bringing people together. Look at that. <laughs> Killing I <laughs> know, right? The Beautiful. blood and the gore. It's, Who knew? It's For crazy real. that women and black people die so soon in, uh, in horror movies, because come on, yeah. women are so much smarter than men. Will we yeah. really be the ones dying? Right. And the two black girls survived. Like, we did it. On. Right. We did it. And, I remember and, the first time that. It was Deep Blue Sea. With LL Cool J? LL Cool J was Deep Blue Sea. LL Cool J was the chef on the submarine with a parrot for some reason. I remember this poster. I, just, yeah. I remember this. Oh, the, my God. Huge. That was a huge Sam film. Jackson is delivering this speech about how we're not going to let the shark get us. And the shark comes up out the water and eats him while he's delivering the speech. <laughs> One of the best things ever. But LL Cool J, hi, he's oh the chef gosh. and he hides in the oven. He's in the oven with the oven door closed. Not LL. LL with the, with the parrot. <laughs> Him and a parrot, and he's kicking. He Dang. got the and the shark is trying. And in this movie, it's mechanical sharks or like mm-hmm. enhanced the sharks. Pyrotechnics, like yeah. But now like, if you look at it, the shark doesn't look so good, right? Because the shark is like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, deep blue sea. I'm thinking about the fog with D Ray. Remember but, the fog with D Ray? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> leprechaun. Oh, oh, he's God like B movie. Yeah, love it. What you know about leprechaun? What you leprechaun? <laughs> I haven't seen that in forever. Yo, not what you is, know about is leprechaun. Is leprechaun the one with? With the raps, is that there's a there's that with the raps. There's Leprechaun back to the hood. And the Leprechaun's <laughs> rapping, a, right? Yes. Yo, there's she's one there's right. one with Jennifer Aniston. She's right. And there's Leprechaun two back to the hood. Leprechaun yeah. two back to the hood and the Leprechaun got bars. Son. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, funny shit. Leprechaun was a killing bars, rapping son. Leprechaun. <laughs> <laughs> Please find it. Oh my god. You, honestly, I'm trying Yo. your parents are so cool. And I'm I'm really trying to decide if I'm gonna be that cool. Oh no. Talib pulls up everything on the show. Like he's always on YouTube. Because yo, you brought me right back with this leprechaun it's shit. Leprechaun back to the hood. Right. <laughs> we were talking about we were with, with um Ali Asha, right? He was talking about bad raps oh, or like funny. like. <laughs> <laughs> Not the music. No. I can't see it. You have a privacy. Oh my god, it's terrible. <laughs> 
Lip in the hood? You lip in the hood? A lip in the hood? I come got in. you. <laughs> <laughs> Not the land. <laughs> Wait, I'm, I'm, he said, I come yo. from the land of the Irish Spring. <laughs> oh, my God. Not the Irish Spring. So like an Irish person definitely didn't write that. <gasps> no, because that's soap. You think yeah. black people were on this writing team? I hope. I, I hope. And, and they wasn't on there. It was a friend of a friend. You know, people it had you, to be. It's like, yeah. what does he say? We can look Write it up it and see who's yeah. in the writer's room. <laughs> But, you know, that's um, how black people get to do if you don't have, know how to do a oh Jamaican accent. Just try to do an Irish accent. <laughs> yeah, sometimes my... my and it'll sound Jamaican. ...merges together. Uh, so yeah, your parents are so freaking cool that you watched all of these things that obviously you were not old enough to be watching. Right. And I'm trying to figure out, because I, was, I wasn't allowed to watch R-rated movies or curse words or anything, so I missed out on so many shows. Yeah. And like, we'll be on here, and then I'll go back and watch a show that everyone else has seen or a movie that everyone else has seen, because it's like... You didn't, I didn't watch it as a child and you kind of forgot about it. But I feel mm -hmm. like I have to allow Coco to watch these films. Oh, yeah, Coco. man. I think that for me, my and my daughter's here and she knows. Diani, what age was it that you were really into horror films? Um, young. Young, right? Like, like 10, right? Yeah. Like oh, 10, wow. 11 years old. Wow. She was like, yo, can we watch? I'm like, are you sure? Right. <laughs> okay. Right. okay. Yeah. We... Like the hills wow. have eyes, shit like oh. that, like like really bad ones. Dang, yeah, I still I think haven't I even seen the OG Coco's Texas gonna be over your, your house, like yeah, Uncle Tyler, let me watch. That's like, the first real final girl, the girl from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Uh, mm -hmm. I still haven't brought myself to watch. She's it. The, she's the first one to really survive and wow. set the trend off for final girls. I did wow. my research for final girls. That was like wow. the first. I did not know that. Yeah, that's so cool. That is cool, man. You play a, a blah, blah blah blah. An instant mom. You play a rock and a rock girl. A rock girl, like, like, what do you mean? A rock singer. I'm sorry. <laughs> right, she went on her rock girl. audition. There was well, a, I was oh, starting yeah, over anyway because our lips phone yeah. interrupted me. We're gonna blame it on that. Yeah. yeah. A rock girl. She's like, what is that? I don't know. Do I throw rocks down the street? What show were you watching? Rocks I got like, out of jail. I was like, oh yeah, Gabby did do that one episode where she was like auditioning. You was with me. You was, you was trying to. You was. I got you. Yeah. And Tia took your spot. She sure did. Yeah. You play a rock singer. In Instant Mom, and you play a poet in Someone's Inside Your House. Do you do music or poetry of your own? Or I do. You I'm do. actually working on my EP right now. Really? Yes. I am. Is singing? Yep, I'm singing. Okay. Laid down vocals for this one track that I wrote, and my producer is really, really dope. He's actually from... Ohio originally, but now uh, him and his wife moved here. And into my building, actually, we all moved into the same building like a year ago, but they're from Atlanta. And um, I was having drinks with his wife by the pool. I hadn't met her husband yet. Mm -hmm. And we were just chilling, you know, having a good time. And I was saying, like, this is such a huge part of me, my my artistic expression. Like, I mm -hmm. need to do music. I feel like in a lot of ways it was kind of like my first love because mm -hmm. I just really was singing all the time and, like, mm -hmm. writing all the time and... I just, I love music. I love production. I love like immersing myself in that world. And so she was like, oh, word? Like my husband is a really dope producer. And I was like, okay. She was like, yeah, we have a studio not too far from where we live. Awesome. So I connected with him. He connected with me with another awesome girl who's like my vocal coach and mm -hmm. like co-writer. And But it's been amazing. Like we are, I feel so in my element because I'm able to focus on all of parts of myself that I love where I can go within and really mm -hmm. be vulnerable, which I've learned to tap more into as I get older. And it's therapeutic for me in that way, but then I can focus yes. on like producing and composing and singing and writing and then like eventually directing my own music mm -hmm. videos right. and costume design. It's like all of these elements that I love and I feel in a lot of ways more in tune with myself than I do with acting because it's so personal to me. Mm -hmm. And I'm yeah. in control and I can just sit there and like have a toke and have a drink and like lay down a fucking like song, you know, right. that's like coming from my heart. I thought you were about to say heart. banger. <laughs> a banger, yeah. yeah. I mean, like, that's the hope. But mostly it's <clears> like, <throat> now that I'm in this position where um, I can use my platform and not be like the struggling artist, I can do it in a more authentic way mm -hmm. where there, it, it alleviates the pressure. It's more like me being in competition with myself. Like, how can mm -hmm. I put my best foot forward? How can I go even deeper how can I make it even more different, more special, and more unique to my own experience as yes. opposed to like, I got to do this to get money, and mm -hmm. I got to be on the radio, and then I got to do this. It's like, no, I'm doing this because I need to, like for my soul. Yeah, I'm so glad you said all that because I would have guessed 100% that 
just looking at your body of work and looking how, at how you perform, I'm like, she sings or produces or something, plays I guitar do. or something. Yeah. Um, we had Salema Masekela on the show, and he used to go by Sal Masekela. Um, but he talked about changing his name, starting to get people to call him by his given name, which is Salema, around the time of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. But one thing we didn't bring up in the interview that I noticed that he said is what gave him the courage to call himself by his born name, his African name, yeah. as opposed to Sal, is when he started to make music mm. and opening himself up in that way. And he's like, that gave me this, what you just described is what he was describing in this other interview I read. It's like, that made me more comfortable to say, no, I'm I'm Salema. I'm not Sal. Yeah. yeah. It's a, it's a, it's been a really heart opening experience for me to tap into this part of myself and challenge myself. Mm. Like I just, rewrote another song yesterday, like thought of a melody. And I feel like it's a flow of energy where now I'm owning it mm -hmm. because I was, a lot of people don't know that I sing. And, mm -hmm. and it's so funny because now I'm like, dang, I can really sing. Like, mm. and a lot of people don't know yeah, that. Own that. And so I'm owning it and I'm getting more comfortable with singing. And I remember the first time with my producer and my girl, and we were just like, I sent them a voice memo and it was my first time really playing my own original stuff in mm -hmm. front of somebody. And it was like, you know, kind of rough, like voice memo, th the thoughts in my head. And I was like, okay, it's time to get used to this. It's time yeah. to get used to sharing this part of yourself. Yeah. Wow. You're, you're learning so much of yourself at such a young age like that. Like, And it emanates from you. I can hear it. Oh, in for your, sure. It is emanating from you. Yeah. Um, Thanks, guys. What can you tell us about- I'm trying. Dead Dad's Club with Randall Park and oh, Kristen shit. Bell. Ooh, I, I really hope Kristen this movie Bell. gets made. Yeah. I just hope it gets made. I was cast like right before the pandemic, like a mm -hmm. week before. Mm -hmm. And then all this stuff happened. And, you know, Sanaa is supposed to play my mom. So we mm -hmm. did a whole table read. Randall is like He's a amazing. long time homie. I really? mean, knew okay. him back in the day when he was doing stand up at the end. You have the same last name. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's Uncle Park, you right. know? Like, yeah. <laughs> but um, I mean, it'd be a dream to work with him and, and, and Kristen and Sanaa. Like, that script is hilarious. I didn't know she was attached to that. So Sanaa. dark. Yes, yeah, Sanaa's going to be Stan my mama. Lathan as well. This yes. Man, like, love he was such her. A, uh, yeah, he's a great. Mm, love Chris, it. Kristen Bell's hilarious. We had her husband on like, the very beginning. Yeah, of Dax was part. one of our first guests. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. he's a character. I've met him. A yeah, he was times. wearing his overalls. And yeah, he um, <laughs> he once, tracks. I once I had a guy show up at my show, threatening me outside. This guy showed up at my show with a "fuck Quali" sign, <laughs> right? And he's on Instagram like with the sign, <laughs> protesting outside my show. I'm you backstage know? with with I Dax Shepard. <laughs> yeah, I'm backstage with Dax, <laughs> and Dax is like, "Let's go out there," and I'm like. I would have probably thought that if you weren't here, but I was like, I'm over here. I'm, but I'm like, yeah, that's exactly what the fuck we should do. Right. <laughs> and we went out there. So on my Instagram for like three years ago, it's me oh and gosh. Dax and rest in peace to Dave New York and rest my man Jose peace. confronting Aww. this guy Aww. outside of my show until the cops showed up. And what did he say? He said, you called the cops on me. I was like, <laughs> cops, are, they might take me in. He right, was right. in the way I'm at it. Huh? And he was like a Hispanic guy. Oh. You know, He might have identified as Latino. I don't know. <laughs> so, I assume by Jeez. the way he came at me that he identifies as Hispanic. But look how much, like, the fact that he was out there by no. himself, like, you No, but I'm going to say it was funny. No chill. He, 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 when I saw him, Get he didn't alive. have the sign because a fan, a fan of mine ripped up his sign <laughs> and posted this on the internet. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Wait, the fan found him on the street and was no, like, give a, me that. Like, yeah, yeah fan, like, a fan like walked up to him and was like talking to him. I couldn't hear the conversation. And he takes the sign, he rips it up. <laughs> oh, but my But the guy gosh. left and he comes back without the sign. Oh. He comes back, he's like, yeah, I'm outside. And Dax is like, let's go see him. Just and I was like, oh, Dax is scrappy. I didn't understand Did how scrappy he was. Did he have overalls then too? Yeah, he didn't have overalls on. But no. he, had, uh, <laughs> he had Joy Bryant with him. He said, she didn't come outside with us though. Yeah, he's scrappy. That's funny. Yeah, I don't know. I think I probably would just like die it. of. First of all, if someone was, if, if if anybody was outside with a fuck Jasmine Lee, I'm just like, I fucking <laughs> made it. Like this is my moment, right? Like, like I got haters. I got yeah. haters in public. Yo, that guy, <laughs> that guy still trolls me. This wow. shit was like three, four years ago. That guy, I think, trolled me yesterday. That's the same guy. What's his name? I don't know. All right, some guy. 
Listen, we know, she, we she know a you. writer. We know you. Sydney is a writer. I like this. Yeah. I Yo, so. I just found that yeah. I had writers yesterday. I like posted a, uh, what I thought was a funny, realistically, I mean, fake uh, beef. People thought it was like a real beef. And I found out I had like five writers on Instagram that was ready to go to war for me. Right and I was done. like, hell yeah, let's mm-hmm. do that. Yep. So we've had such a good time it's with you here. I've um, had an amazing time. Thank you. Before we get out of here, um, First Love, this is something else <clears throat> that you got coming up, right? Yes. Tell me about this. Yes. Um, First Love is a really beautiful script and story that I fell in love with uh, as soon as I read it, um, written and directed by a guy named A.J. Edwards. Mm-hmm. And his work is really great. And he studied under Terrence Malick for a long time. Wow. And um, yeah, he's a very a special brilliant human. Brilliant director. Brilliant. Yeah. yeah. And A.J. is... Very, very, very special and specific. And the script was like a blueprint. And then me and uh, Hero Finds Tiffin, my homie and my mm-hmm. co-star, we really found this like amazing thread and like connection between our characters and just our vibe and like us connecting as humans and you know sharing the same vision with AJ. But then like it just turned out to be better than we had expected and. Um, I'm excited to see it. I haven't seen any like anything from it yet except for some stills, mm-hmm. but I think it'll be coming out next year. We got Jeffrey Donovan, Diane Kruger in it, mm-hmm. and Sharon Leal, and um, it was a really awesome project to work on. We worked on it out here in LA. It was okay. an indie project. We did it for like three weeks, okay. and uh, very special. Very well, special. we are looking forward to that as well, and we are looking yeah. forward to everything and all the beauty that you have to give to this world. Thank you for joining us on People's Party. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.